It's important to see people that come from where you come from, that look like you, doing the things that you might dream of doing. Because it'll only stay a dream. if you don't really feel like you have access to it. Here's the ABL effect, right? So you got Jabari, who has a great eye in terms of marketing musical talent. And you have W that has a great eye for talent in terms of art. These two guys got together and put together something amazing. That makes me proud, makes me want to go even harder. It makes me want to go run through a brick wall for them and everybody else that works with this production. Think about this. I'm in my 14th season. Half of the time I've been doing this, I've been walking around doing it with kidney disease. That's how inspiring those two gentlemen are in my life. You get what I'm saying? Art, beats, and lyrics, for me, the art that you see, the music you hear, and the culture in the rooms when you're at one of these events, it represents the nobility of what I know hip hop is. It, it represents the dignity that I know these kids who started this art form from nothing have. And it, it, and it's, it, it says something to the resilience of the human spirit that in some of the toughest times, you got people in a room together, sipping good drink, listening to good music, witnessing with their eyes, you know, beautiful works of art by other people. Uh, just one second. Them niggas making too much noise. Yeah, get the fuck out of the way, man. What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> That's outcast DJ guy. He doesn't really need the job, you know what I mean? <laughs> nah, me, That's dog, right. <laughs> Let's get it. Come on. All right, y'all. We're gonna do something a little different today. Jack Daniels Art Beats and Lyrics event is coming up. Art Beats and Lyrics. Thanks for watching Art Beats and Lyrics. And today, I have Jabari and I have W. My name is Jabari Graham. This is W on my right hand side. We have this art show called Art Beats and Lyrics, and it's pretty cool. But we got dope art, dope music. We mix them all together to provide an interactive experience for the audience. So you're not just going to a gallery with just white walls. All the walls are designed and have colors so that it enhances the viewing experience. Just great art, great people, great vibes. What are they gonna see? What are you not gonna see? Anything could happen. It's a wonderful production for you to come in and experience black culture through visual art and music. It is an experience. This is where the cool kids in school go to find out what's cool so they can tell whoever else is cool what's cool. I went by myself and had the time of my life. <laughs> and that's cool. Jack Honey Art Beats and Lyrics is a beautiful institution. It's a place, it's this hub that Dub and Jabari have made for us to constantly keep on coming back to, and then it travels the nation. Atlanta, how are y'all doing? The artists that we love, but larger than life. Classy event, man, 110%. And became a launching pad for artists and their careers. We had no idea that thousands of people would show up and try to get in. These guys wanting to push it now, and in the push, there becomes push back. Galleries and museums weren't really set up with the black community in mind. We were completely outside of their comfort level. They don't really highlight urban artists. It is the absolute responsibility of the artist to paint outside the line. Defining your exhibitions on your own terms. It's as punk rock and as hip hop as you can get. Art beats and lyrics, man. <laughs> I just wanted dope art. Just something that speaks to me, that I like, that I would like to hang on my wall, or that I saw that was in the Source magazine, those illustrations. I just wanted art that reflected my lifestyle or something that was just fresh, you know, that I didn't see in the galleries that I visited. It's 
So my domain with ABL is really the admin part. That is uh, managing the budgets, getting event permits, book flights to travel, logistics with the shipping, getting the, the semi-truck to the venue, booking the venue, weekly calls with uh, the Jack Honey teams. Um, it's really the nuts and bolts of uh, making the show happen. You know, just, you know, one, all the, all the places I did, so. so next tour is our 20th anniversary, and we're kicking off our 20th anniversary tour in Miami during Art Week. Most of the time, I may be here, you know, the boring job, you know, but Dub is over at Warehouse with the artists getting down. And, and it's cool to be over here, do the admin part, but go over there and just see the progress of what's going on on the walls. Dub, he is that right brain. He wrangles all the artists. When we're working at the warehouse, he's painting the walls, creating the flyers, the creative, the website, everything is with Dub's touch on there. So this is the warehouse that we're gonna be building the tour out in. We work with the artists and see their vision and what they have going on and try to turn the volume up on it. Because we wanna make sure that when the audience comes to the shows, they get a visual experience that is probably more than what they're used to. And we want them to leave excited and inspired. So this is where the magic starts to happen, the visual magic. We have a show we set up, basically different shaped wall configurations, and artists come in to create their installations. They have several weeks to make their piece come to life. And all the work must be completed in time for the Miami show. Artists don't really have the best reputation for being like on time or being, you know, like, <laughs> like put together people. So what is it like, is it like, are there any challenges in wrangling all these different personalities and artists and styles? Yeah, it can be challenging at times, but I'm an artist as well, so I kind of know how people get down. You got to continuously remind them. You know, giving definite dates help. Usually we get in here and set up the walls and we got to redo everything because you know, we want to change the show each year. We change everything, so it's going to be a brand new show. So the first step is we like to get the walls in here and resurface them, repair them and everything because these walls go from city to city year after year. So we want to make sure they're right for the artists to come in and do their thing. So we want to make sure that we can do what we got to do in here first and get it right so we can take it on the road. Thank you, thank you, Thanks, thank you. Man. Good thank seeing you again, man. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Gordon. Yes, sir. All right. All right, so you can lock it up. Yeah. Break it down. Keep it real simple. Like, when you say art, are you talking, like, graffiti? Well, it's a, it's a lot more than just graffiti, because um, the urban art scene is expanded to all the way out to fine art, um, a lot of other forms of aerosol art, and mm -hmm. some people do sculptures. You know, and this right here is an opportunity to highlight those artists. You can actually see their work and um, you know, maybe you know, meet them or buy some people. The process of selecting artists, you know, it, it varies a little bit. Um, when we first started, it was just our friends and stuff like that, and picking people. Now, it's more along the lines, we have artists that we use regularly, some of the regulars, and we leave it open to find new people. We just try to pick the best work we can. That's how we slowly start filling all the slots for the show. ABO gives an uh, up-and-coming artist, a shot to take their work and showcase their work, not only in their city, but across 10 markets. We are a moving gallery. It's not like we're just trying to showcase your work for one night. Yeah, we're, we're going to 10 cities. It's a good promotional value. We may sell your artwork, we may not, but at least you're gonna get some eyeballs in front of your artwork. Sean Stewart is an artist we found during an artist call, and I believe this is his third year doing stuff with us. He just started painting like less than seven years ago. And his background is in art, it's football. So he went from being a football player to now he's a painter. So right now we have the walls set up and we just gotta figure out which wall you're gonna do. I was thinking about keeping the age demographic similar because okay. I still wanted to be in the realm of black children, black youth, you know what okay. I'm saying? And uh, I guess really pushing them to the forefront, I guess that's my own personal message currently right now. He is a sponge for knowledge, and you can see him taking what you say and implementing it. 
immediately. Every season we watch his work get better and better and better. In the next few years, you're gonna see a lot more of his work a lot of places. Lizette, also known as Art Attic, was also in that same artist call that we did. Even though she wasn't the artist that was selected to win, her work was so strong that we got her in the show. I went through a phase in my life where I was like super revolutionary, obviously angry about all the injustices, but I realized that you could be angry, you could go on these rants and all this stuff, or you could just give people the facts in a colorful way. She comes from a graphic design and graphic illustration background. So her work ethic is second to none. And she's continuously out there doing murals and doing projects and becoming a beast out there. Cindy and I go way back to like, you know, MySpace days. She is a figurative painter based out of Detroit. Right now, she's on fire. You know, she has her own mural festival out in Detroit, which is incredible. When she comes and brings her skill set to our wall, she sets the tone for the warehouse. She's awesome. She's probably the realest person I know. <laughs> We're in front of Sam Flax. It's the local art supply store. Also known as Church. <laughs> <laughs> yep, so we're gonna go to the spray can section, so make sure that you get everything you need. I think I'm gonna try this watercolor brush. But look, I got these neons, see? Mm -hmm. I wanna add them to my flesh tones. I wanna see what it do. Okay, you can mix it on the, on the board. <laughs> yes, it's go I'm experimenting, but it's gonna work out. All right. Don't worry about it. Dub was always a giver of information people would keep certain things to themselves, like whether it was a technique, connections, because they might look at you as competition. But that's not real. There's always enough for everybody to eat. And that's how Dub has always treated me. Like, I think I did like a cold call on him. Like, I sent him a message like, hey, cause he was like the man, you know, for like hip hop illustration, like Source Magazine, Fader, XXL. He was the illustrator that everybody knew. And I sent him a message like, hey, how are you getting all those magazines? And da, 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 da. He sent me back a list of 100 emails. Like, hey, just reach out to these people. We've been cool ever since. So I'm thinking on the second wall, if we make a giant record that takes up the space, yeah. and you do some type of drawing or something, you can like recreate your own version of an album cover, and then have the actual vinyl popping out the side. And then you can do some digital stuff to make it an album cover. Yeah. And then I think that can pretty much wrap up the whole installation. Yeah. That's going to be dope. Worthy of an anniversary. Several things actually inspired this piece. I'm from Detroit. It's the 20th season anniversary for Arts, Beats, and Lyrics. This is Smiley. She was one of the first female rappers out of Detroit. So I wanted to, like, Pay her homage, you know, in this creative space. Black people in general inspires most of my art. I paint us exactly how the world sees us, but I paint it in a way that's opposite of the negative connotations that are often put on specifically black women. You know, too loud, too boisterous, too flamboyant. So I make sure I put all of the tools into all of my work. I'm gonna make us too big. I'm gonna make us too bold. And it's gonna be beautiful. Because we are those things, and it's not negative at all. A lot of us don't have access, and access starts with your eyes, really, like being exposed to something that's real. You have a lot of art pioneers in Detroit, and that created lanes for all of us. Because, you know, really pre-90s, a lot of doors weren't open to us, like gallery doors, museum doors. So we had to create our own ways for our work to be seen and to even do work. And I feel like Atlanta has a lot of those same qualities. In my mind, the city of Atlanta for black people is what Mecca is to Muslims. You know, it's only right that art, beats, and lyrics exist here. The ground is fertile for it because people understand that there's more in it for everyone if we cooperate and collaborate. Because I think that you have the most cross-culturally connected group of black people possibly here too. It is filled with people from other ethnicities, but yet somehow these communities have figured out 
how to cooperate and collaborate. It's always important in anybody's community to know who the artists are. In our community, we talk to each other, we build with each other, and try to raise the tide so that we can lift all ships. We've had leaders here, both black and white, that understood that the progression of all of us as Southerners and as Georgians mattered more than the egos of who was serving the house and who was serving the field. And it's not utopia in any way, but it is a place of infinite opportunity from someone who's grown up here. You see what's in front of you, but what's in front of you always comes from what's behind you. During the Black Arts Movement in the 80s, Atlanta became a hub for Black Arts expression. With the Civil Rights Movement being here, the arts played a major role in the Civil Rights Movement. And then the city also became sort of the center for entertainment uh, right after Reconstruction. Artists led the way in entrepreneurship, and the artists were a significant part of the city's fabric. When you see other industries like film, technology, science, there's a disparity. Our story is not always present. And so there was a need at the time in the 80s to have a flagship arts organization that presented arts from the African diaspora. Good morning, and welcome to a very festive edition of Under the Sun. We're here enjoying the National Black Arts Festival and all the rich cultural character it has to offer. Organizers of this celebration set out to create an artistic bridge between the past, present, and future. We have over 100 events in eight artistic disciplines, theater, film, dance, folk arts, literature, performance art, and music. People will come to Atlanta from all kinds of places to experience this arts festival. Artist vendors could sell their wares and their works that they created, but there were also musical productions, dance productions, and art exhibitions planned during this time. In Atlanta, coming to the Black Arts Festival for the first time, I was exposed to how the Black art industry was exploding. Seeing a Black artist with amazing work making a living, and then you start seeing a bunch of them. It's like finding, oh wow, there's a Michael Jordan. But wait, there's about eight, nine, ten different Michael Jordans. You know, that's it's mind blowing. I remember when my cousin Darian came down to be a part of the National Black Arts Fest, and I'm sitting at his booth, and his artwork is centered towards my age range. You know, the hip hop crowd. I noticed that no one was really coming to his booth because the National Black Arts Fest was probably more geared towards. 35 plus at the time. There were elders who ran the festival. What we had was something that those organizations needed. I was like, all right, what if there was an art event that kind of catered towards a younger demographic, someone like me? Because I went to galleries and I was like, yo, it's just stuffy. It's white walls, it was just no flavor. So there's an opportunity I want to engage in. All right, just keep that in the back of my head. The Black Arts Festival, really put Atlanta on the map. We're having a black renaissance here, like in Harlem, and as the arts community grew, so did the hip hop community in Atlanta. During the hip hop movement in Atlanta, there were many people creating work that connected to the music. So there was graffiti, creative clothing, and it was really the underground and what people are communicating from their firsthand experience of that community. In the 90s, uh, the folks got the opportunity to enjoy the fruits of the labor and innovations of Maynard Jackson and his policies. So we were pretty vibrant, creative, innovative in the arts, uh, free in expression, and uh, pretty magical. Atlanta has so much history around um, resistance. So hip hop in Atlanta is a result of that. That grassroots grind hustle with the blues. 
It is going to be in your face. It is going to address the current and contemporary issues of today. So to empower that is to empower a generation. Right now we're in Lithonia, Georgia. This is where I graduated high school and met a lot of friends. So this is a good origin spot for me. Around this time, this is when I was an artist, you know? I mean, they had art class here and I used to do my sketches during class. My interest just changed from, you know, being an artist to wanting to be an entrepreneur. I was just more fascinated with business and how you can create a product or how you can be a part of a product or a team and sell it or sell your ideas. And that became my canvas. Uh, this neighborhood is uh, Little Five Points. And it's crazy because my mom used to drive past here and used to always think like, man, this is where weird people hang out as a kid. But growing up, I started hanging out here more often. So I was like, well, shit, I'm one of them weird people, you know? So this is just a community for artists and, you know, boutiques. It's very vibrant. I liked it. I used to hang out here a lot. So it's a cool area. You gonna bust? Huh? You gonna bust? Uh... You can bust if you want. Go ahead, you got the stick. All right, all right. <laughs> you know, growing up, my folks were divorced, so I spent my summers with my dad in Florida and my mother's school here in Atlanta. And they were figuring things out. But I got to see both of them becoming themselves. My father is an entrepreneur, and my mother is a teacher who became a principal. So it was a great example for myself to see both of them advancing in their industry. As a kid, he was just like any normal kid. He liked to have play with his peers and have fun and things like that. But he was also very young. I noticed that he was like an entrepreneur. I remember when Blockbuster used to rent video games. And at the time, Jabari had a lot of video games, and I didn't know it, but he was renting his video games to his friends. And I was like, oh no, Jabari, you, you shouldn't do that. These are your friends. And then we went to Blockbuster one day, and I saw that they were renting video games. And I'm like, okay, you can go back to your business. <laughs> and I think, you know, just from being around us, translated back into his life. So, okay, I got a dream. You know, I got something I want to do. I can stop my own entity and do my own thing. When you see you can be, what he saw was not beyond reach. I think my number one art critic is coming in. Okay. It's the point where you stare directly into the camera. <laughs> uh -huh. And this is where we send you to mommy. <laughs> Do you know that? Well, I like to say we met at an underground arm wrestling competition. Or? Or, you know, as a prize fighter overseas, <laughs> high stake card game. game. We like to change the story to keep it interesting. You meet somebody, share common interests, and then one day you're married, been in a relationship for 13 years, and have a baby. And this is our son. Mm -hmm. This is our greatest uh, collab. Also known as Rockwell. He's like, y'all not gonna stop me? <laughs>
Norman Rockwell is my favorite artist, hands down. Number one on my list. His work is, first of all, phenomenal. He was able to capture the essence of a moment, and he was able to do it hundreds of times. Anybody could have a good painting. You know, if you paint long enough, you'll get one good one. But how do you have hundreds of them? If you know painting, you're like, that guy's amazing. All right, so this is my home office. This is where I come up with ideas and work when I'm at home. And these are some of the things that I like having around me. Some of the pieces I've done in the past and some things that just keep me inspired. Capturing, documenting, promoting, illustrating hip hop culture has been my thing. You know, that was the wave I rode in on. It was the culture, pretty much, that I was growing up in. Originally, I'm from Brooklyn, and then around the age of nine, I moved down to Fayetteville, North Carolina. And around that time, hip hop was a soundtrack to everybody's life. It was in the fashion that people wore, in the way people viewed things. So hip hop gave me a theme to carry through my work. Growing up, drawing was my outlet, you know? That was my way of communicating with people. That's the way I made friends. And one of my closest friends was a guy named Fabian, and we have an interesting history. People would bring drawings that he did to me. They'd be like, can you draw better than this guy named Fabian? And my answer was, absolutely. One day, I'm at my locker, and I close it, and I turn around, and there's this strange kid behind me, and he says, Hey, I heard you could draw. <laughs> so, you know, that's how we met. It was good to have somebody that shares a lot of the same ideas and influences and sentiment, because he understood what it was like for me as an urban artist. The things that I would paint and Dub would paint are like relative to our perspective and our lives. So a lot of times that just had nothing to do with white people. So when we do things about black people, they're like, why are you always paying black people? I'm black. <laughs> my cultural identity comes through my work because that's the lens I see things through. You know, I can't really see things from outside of that. And that's why in my work, it has a certain look, it has a certain feel, and that's all coming from inside. Over here is one of the last illustrations I did in college. It was my senior show poster. And I wanted to do a poster that was tying into some of the things I liked, and I was into black exploitation movies in college. And I did an illustration of myself. Oh, Super. That's you. Yeah, it's me. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so I did a picture yeah, of me. Yeah, okay. And when you put your poster up, you want it to be stolen, because that means you did a dope poster. But you don't want people to steal it before anybody sees it, because then nobody will know to come to your show. Back in college, I wanted to do hip hop illustration work. But at the time, Urban art really wasn't super mainstream. And one of the professors, they saw my poster and they didn't like it. And I remember coming up to me and saying, you know, you are better than this. And I was blown away with that. I'm like, really? Because technically it was a solid piece, but I really wasn't doing it for her. I was doing it for the people that like what I do. And I think that's something that kind of like stuck with me even through my professional career. After college, before the web bubble. Designers were like rock stars. There was a lot of money flying around. So everybody that came out of college that had an art degree, even if you had a fine art degree, you ended up somewhere in some graphic design department doing some sort of design work. Companies would fly me down for the day, pick me up in a limo, drive me out to a nice restaurant, and try to convince me to work for them. It was wild. The first job I accepted you know, they called me up to like, hey, we'd like for you to come work for us down here in Atlanta. And this was like on a Monday. I'm like, I could be there Wednesday. When I first moved here, it just felt like a, a freedom that I never experienced before. Being away from North Carolina and having outlets where people take my ideas and be like, okay, you could do that. It was the first time I felt like anything I could think of could actually happen here. And I love that. after graduating Jackson State University. I came back home and I needed to build my resume. So I went to the Atlanta University Center Career Placement Office and I found an internship for Universal Circus. Boom, 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 boom. Let me do my name. 
We founded the Universal Circus in 1994 with an idea to reflect the positive contributions that urban culture makes in the world through circus arts. Universal Circus was a combination of theater. It was like going to, you know, almost a musical event as well as a, a, a circus. There was an infusion of a new form of art and people had never seen this type of entertainment with the fusion of the music and the theater, you know, and the singing and dancing, which was just a part of our cultural experience. When we first met Jabari, he wasn't a follower and I was impressed at his ability to see where things were going and not just where they were. Working with the circus, I learned a lot about marketing, promotions, budgeting, community engagement, and toured around the country. I'm seeing firsthand a blueprint of what I'm doing for ABL. They had a sponsorship deck, and I flipped it to an ABL deck. I didn't have the event at the time, so I'm just using images of what I think this show can be. Working for the circus was one of the best times of my life, but the seasons of Universal Circus ends in the fall. Money's not generating, and I got laid off. I hated the idea of letting anyone go, but his departure was also the wellspring that allowed him to emerge. After I got laid off, I came back home, and it wasn't the best time of my life because I didn't know who I was or what I was going to do. And during that time at the unemployment office, they always have a TV running while you're sitting in the line. And it was Les Brown. And I always remember him saying that during this time, you could either find a job or create a job. And I was like, yo, let me try to create a job. What's going on? My name is Jabari Graham. Uh, myself and others, we uh, created our show called Art Beats and Lyrics. The main idea for Art Beats and Lyrics is to get a younger, audience involved with art appreciation at a level that we all can feel. Um, it highlights urban art. And what I mean by urban art is artwork that you see among the city, among the streets, among the walls. So uh, with these local artists, they really didn't have a chance to, you know, get their artwork in galleries um, or, you know, museums per se. So we took that chance to highlight it. The first show that we did was at the Five Spot in Little Five Points of Atlanta. This place is aisle five, but aisle five used to be the five spot. And this is where I did the first Art Beats and Lyrics show. The first show came from a lot of hustle. One, I had to find an artist, which was just beating the pavement. Back then, it was uh, just random conversations. Hey, I'm doing this art show. Do you want to be a part of it? Because I didn't have no weight to my name. I was just taking pictures of graffiti or tags around town or just art works and I'm taking it to retail stores, like, hey, do you know this artist? And I, I didn't get any movement. One of those meetings that I had was with Dan the Man and Lord Yada. They introduced me to um, some artists, and from there, it trickled down to more artists. And that's that. I think that's probably how I met Dub. I used to always see Dub's artwork around Little Five Points and just his style was just dope. So I reached out to him to be a part of this first show, and that's how our relationship kind of took off. When I first met him, he's like a young guy, you know, trying to do an art show, and I was like, okay, you know, I'll be in it. And plus, a lot of the other artists I knew were in it. So he went and did a great job of rounding up all these artists in the scene, and that was not an easy task because there wasn't social media. This is where I passed out flyers and putting up posters in different retail locations. So this is how I promoted the show. I knew I wanted to attract these people that shopped in Little Five Points or that were creatives over here. So this was my Facebook. For that one night, the Five Spot was just a dope gallery. You go in and it was like artwork on top of artwork on top of artwork all in the place. And the energy was good. You know, we're all young artists trying to get our name out there and trying to be part of a scene. I didn't know what was going to happen. 
but we just saw opportunity, an artist that's not giving a shot, and it worked. At the end of the night, I think we had like around 400 people, and this is a dive bar that can probably only hold like 200 people. The idea of giving the artists that are in our circle a chance to be out there and get their work seen, that was definitely inspiring. One thing that I noticed about Dove, he's a, he's a dope artist, but he, he's, a, he's a great business person too. Um, and I think that kind of attracted me to him. I remember when I gave Dub back his artwork at the end of the night, and um, we kind of just joined at the hip. So this is my MLK piece. And I always like to use this piece as like my key point where I saw like my career starting to flourish and getting people to really recognize my aesthetic. I use vibrant colors for color therapy. You know, like I wanna make people happy. I wanna make our city look vibrant and just bring like joy and energy to people as they're passing by. And on top of that, this feels like Martin Luther King to me versus all the black and white images. Like, to me, this is who he was, this dreamer and a vibrant soul. All right, this is definitely number two in my list. Uh, this one I did for, it's a branded mural. I was commissioned to do this for a dance competition. I love this piece because it's like about movement. And I think one of my favorite things about this piece is I was able to like highlight voguing and to me that felt near and dear to my heart because when I came out in New York I was very much so in the ballroom scene and like surrounded by the ballroom family and I'm just gonna provide representations I think that that's like the most important thing to me is I want black and brown people to really feel represented and seen through other elements of the art another thing that's cool about this wall is like I have a friend who is a tagger and he would tell me like yo Lisette Graffiti taggers really respect you because your stuff doesn't really get tagged. And whenever it does, it's like little things that I'm like, mm, kind of looks cool. Like on the donk right now, you see that there's a tag in the door, but I'm like, kind of looks fire. I'm going to leave it. Like it is what it is. I feel like graffiti writers have somewhat of a beef with muralists, namely because we get paid for our work. And so they think that we're kind of making it commercial. But whenever a muralist does a good job, I notice that you don't get tagged. So I feel honored to be respected by the local taggers in Atlanta, for sure. My favorite thing about priming a canvas is that it starts white. Um, I'm Puerto Rican, and in the Caribbean, a lot of, especially Afro-Latinas, we practice um, Lukimi, which is to modern people known as Santaria, and white is has a lot of religious meaning for us. It's purity, um, it attracts peace. It's the start of everything. So now I'm setting up my projector. So once my prime is dry, I can go ahead and project the top part of the leopard, which is gonna be like hanging over the installation. My installation is called The Portal Inside Me. And the leopard has been a big imprint in my art. It's like my signature. OK. I feel like for me, whenever I do my installations for art beats and lyrics, I really want to give people an opportunity to go inside, like to dig deep and feel something. One of the biggest things about my art is like really representing for black and brown people. And for me, that has to do with me being Caribbean too, because I grew up in South Florida and I was surrounded by nothing but Puerto Ricans, Jamaicans, Haitians, all these different people that we all maybe spoke a little bit of a different language, but our values, our food, our music, everything is pretty similar. 
I think if you pay attention more to how a person's soul shines versus paying attention to the skin complexion of them, we wouldn't have so much division. And when I color my people, I never use skin tones. I always use bright colors because I want to show like culturally, we are the same. And if we come together, we'll be better together. I have a chance to have a piece that's gonna to be touring around the nation for all these different people to see, be able to connect with. I might as well leave a lasting impression. After that first show at the Five Spot, I was at this bar working on the deck for ABL. And I overheard two gentlemen talking about their Blackberry. And one of the gentlemen said, oh, well, what line of work are you in? And the guy said he was a brand manager. So I'm like, oh, shit. I'm up here working on my, my deck. I need to get this dude's ear. So I got his attention, and I showed him what I was doing. And I said, hey, I, I did the show in Little Five Points, and my next show is at the High Museum. We have an opportunity to present the show again at the High Museum, which is, I think, is a, you know, a nice opportunity to actually do the show the second time at the high. Um, the high is known for contemporary art and matter of fact, they just showed the Van Gogh exhibit. So to bring urban art in a facility like that is amazing. And hopefully we can get a chance to, um, you know, broaden those horizons, uh, extend people's minds about urban art who naturally really don't get a chance to see it themselves. So bringing it to the high would be you know, just something amazing. Galleries and museums weren't really set up with the Black community in mind. These are spaces where we have entered, but the numbers are still small. So from the staff and the curators and the programmers, there's a small percentage of African Americans in those spaces. And so therefore, it creates limited opportunity for artists to enter in those spaces. Urban art is black art. It's the co-work, which is interesting because I didn't grow up in an urban area. I grew up in a suburb. So should it be called urban art anymore? Not really. It's called black art. And so if you're considered an urban artist, then you're considered an outsider. You're outside of the professional art space. And the kinds of work that you're creating isn't something that they would show in that space. So these artists have had to create their own opportunities and figure out how to take their art to the community so that it was acceptable. With the High Museum, I was working with five to six artists. It was W, Urban Medium, Dosa Kim, Michi, and Fuse Green. I remember at that time, like, Atlanta had, like, some, like, those blog forums or whatever, and, and like, people were just shit-talking, like, uh, who do they think they are and what are they trying to do, and no one wants to see this, and, oh, they're going to be sellouts and all this stuff because there was a sponsor involved and, and all of that stuff. Some people wanted to defeat it before they even saw it. But then I also remember at that time, on our end, it was just excitement. You know, working on the high show, that was the first time, you know, we actually had to communicate and make things happen. And that energy was pretty cool. They were all in there creating and trying to figure this out. So we got the, uh, the photo booth is gonna be here. That's what Memphis is working on here. But then there was that static. Somebody said, well, you guys can't hang artwork on our walls. But that was like another light bulb moment. Maybe we should build our own walls. Catching on the outside, you, know, you undo the top one, you undo the bottom one, and then use the key to kind of... Not only are we going to build our own walls, but I don't want it to be white walls. I want to make sure that we have some freshness. So you have these designs or these patterns on the walls. The walls for the High Museum were do you. and. Basically, bring your dopest piece. And that's how we worked it. At that time, I had a pretty cool studio set up. And the show and the walls and everything was built in my warehouse. 
This day of the show, we transported them over to the High Museum. And then once we got there, they were like, we can't have this here. Can you put it outside? And that kind of like threw us for a loop. We're like, what? Keep in mind, you know, we're artists that work out in the street, graffiti artists and all that. That's, that's not going to go well with them. I just remember being very angry. It's like, I'll bust out all your windows. And, and, I, and I was pretty serious about it. And we had worked really hard for this moment. Here we were, like some guys just thugging it, going to the High Museum. That's the whole point of doing the show, was to bring the graffiti, all the street art, all the urban art, into the museum space for them to try and deny you the opportunity or to deny you on what they had agreed to. Yeah, that's, that's enough to make you make a threat like that. We weren't going to let it not work out. We are going to make it work out. Eventually, they said, OK, you can put this up. The day of the show, we had a ton of artists in the show that had their own following of people back then. And each artist you know, told their people to come out, and they told their people to come out. And it was unusual for the High Museum to do something like this at that time. When you looked down the street, it was like, what the fuck? The entire city came out. Like, it was fucking epic. So when the doors opened, there were so many people trying to see the show that they shut the doors down. There was a period in the show where Jabari and I were outside of our own show and couldn't get back in because they wouldn't open the doors because they were saying that too many people were coming. And the fact that you could shut down a museum in two hours created all types of mythologies and hype. I think more people were in line than actually in the show. So the word was, yo, this show was so crazy that we couldn't even see it. Jabari, man, talk about it, man. What'd you like to say to the people? Yeah, I'm just glad that everybody came out because we all, we all struggled today putting this up, but it was all good at the end. So the main part of the show was in here. Actually, right. the whole show was in here. We didn't have any okay. other spaces, which in comparison to you know the shows we do now, this is like a fraction of the space we operate. So right, right, yeah. what's crazy now is you, you look back at it and you say, wow. So you don't think that something like this would kick off something that'll last for so long. Right, right. You know, I didn't think back when I was, what, 27, that I'd be doing this 20 years later. You know, well, so. I always thought so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> always thought so. Working with the museum was completely outside of our wheelhouse. You know, we've never done anything like that. We went from a dive bar in December to packing out a museum in April. So we were riding high. And then after all that kind of simmered down, you know, it was like, okay, now what? At the end of the show, I, I thought I did a remarkable, dope job. It was the first time something like this happened at the High Museum. But at the end of the night, it was like, man, I, don't, I gotta figure how, do I have enough gas money to get home? Or, damn, I don't even got no money to pay my rent. You know, like, I'm back in the same situation again. It was, it was just ups and downs. But after that show, and after the press that it got, the circus, Universal Circus hired me back. So during this time, um, I'm still trying to do ABL, but I have a steady check from Universal Circus. Like, y'all, we got to hire this cat back. You know, Jabari went back to the circus, and I went back to freelancing. And it was kind of hard to make those planets align again to pull off another show like that. But that was like crushing for me. Because, you know, I was like, this may or may not ever happen again. If you're an entrepreneur, you're in business, you know, especially starting off, everything is not going to grow and everything is not going to be rosy and, and peaches, you know, throughout the whole career. You're going to have those those ups and downs and those those bumps in the road and things like that. And those are the times that you, that you don't give up. If you keep that perseverance going, eventually, you know, things are going to happen. You know, people are going to start coming to you. One thing about artists is we get it done. I don't know how, but we always know, like, it's going to get done. So I think 
for because I've been doing this for so long, I really try not to get too overwhelmed because I know it's going to get done somehow. How do you know it's going to get done? Because I got to get it done. I got to get the check. Got to pay my bills, so the work's got to get done. Go up higher. Higher, higher. So it's going to be pretty much tucked up. The cheeks are going to pretty much be at the edges of the... The black. The black. Yeah. If we attach a board piece of wood on the back of this, you might be able to have it go into the top of it, like lock into the top of it. And it just pops in. OK. When it's done, you lift it up, load it onto the cabin. We're good. Let's OK. Set it up, pick it up. We could have smoke in there? I don't know. <laughs> Putting ideas out there. <laughs> Can I have bubbles? A bubble machine? That would be fire. All right, so I'll get the beanie tomorrow. When I started to do my Taino research, I found out that Tainos are like one of the very few indigenous tribes where the Gasekis, which are the chiefs, are, were women. And I loved that. So for me, I like being able to show that the power of a woman and that they are rulers too and show the strengths of a woman. As of late, I find myself reaching back when I was a kid and things that I went through and things that I experienced in a lot of ways that I guess I needed somebody in my corner to help me build my dreams and help me push things into fruition. And there's a lot of black youth out there that have dreams and aspirations to do a, you know amazing things, world-changing things and they just don't have the right people in their corner to help. So a lot of my work, including this one, is a visual representation of that. This piece is gonna be called Heavy is the Head, the Where is the Crown. I feel like this whole theme of treating our youth as if they were, you know, royalty helps promote that mindset of being above things that can hinder their growth. I want people to see that when they look at my work and realize that these kids are worth it. They're worth the effort. They're worth our effort, you know? So they can be great, man. Artists have a tendency to take themselves too serious. You know, you're your own worst critic. But for me originally, it wasn't necessarily about being perfect. For me, it was more so of a release. It was an escape. Growing up, before I was an artist, I loved football too. It's kind of always been an intricate part of my life. War has been imposed on us, so it's crazy looking at all these scratches and scrapes. And honestly, just the smell of it brings back memories. My last year I actually broke my leg. That was like my official parting from football. But football really taught me how to manage my emotions and how to focus them, which kind of rolls over into my artwork so I can channel what I'm feeling emotionally and mentally and place that somewhere specifically on canvas or on the field. I remember the time where I realized like I could, you know, stand on my own two feet as an artist and do work. I wanted a really big piece for my dining room. I was like, you know, how hard can it be? What held me was the release of that energy, and I loved how it made me feel, and I loved how it turned out. After that, I decided to keep going and just do it in my own personal time. And one of my friends came over. He was like, did you buy these? I was like, no, I painted them, man. You know, I just paint them in the afternoons after work. They're like, bro, what are you doing? You should be selling these. 
I actually had quit my day job and for about a year, I decided to go all in. I struggled and ate ramen and painted people's loved ones. And at the end of that, I was able to say, hey, you're a good artist, but you're not a good enough artist to just do art right now. Currently, I'm kind of like half in, half out. I work in corporate, um, I'm actually a credit analyst. That's my day job. But I'm still very much so on track to getting to the point where I can phase that out, you know, and just simply focus on my art and how I want to express it and all the cool ways that you can give the world your opinion without speaking. Late 2008, we had a chance to really develop the show and grow. Somebody from the circus recommended us to an agency. Jack Daniels is their client. We had to do some test markets, you know. So our first show back since the high was in Charlotte, North Carolina. And we started building out the show again. You know, redo the walls, build those back, build them even more of them, get artists to paint on them, and try to recapture that magic. And going to Charlotte, you know, that's not, you're not playing on the home court there. You know, you're playing in Charlotte. That was our trial run, and it went over. It went over well. We actually bring the show back to Atlanta. We haven't did the show in Atlanta in three to four years, so. It's like us uniting the band back together, you know? Yeah, Putting yeah. That, put all the pieces together and just do a crazy show, man. It was a good group because one thing that I wanted to do with ABL was take it outside of Atlanta. And that's how it was with the circus. You know, they traveled. So we were able to go to Charlotte, St. Louis, obviously we did Atlanta, and then Birmingham. And it was all great responses. So um, we, I mean, we packed whatever venues that we had out. The High Museum was a one-off. That was never thought that that was gonna do anything else other than that one night. This was actually designed to travel and go to different markets. And the show's getting better. And then after that, more cities came and now we became more of a tour. ABL definitely introduced me to like new audiences. Like I've never been to Seattle until ABL went there. Um, lots of cities actually that I, I just didn't go to. Baltimore, I'd never been to Baltimore until I went with uh, the ABL party bus. Is that, is that gonna be covered in, in the dock, the, the party bus? So ABL, ABL had a had a ABL had a party bus. Oh, but I'm sorry, it was a bus that we partied on. What's going on, y'all? ABL. I paid the fare and the cost to be the boss hog. I got that thing that make your motherfucking head nod. It's just ridiculous. You heard the name Tilly. She pledged to get the coin and stay the fuck up on my business. We rented a tour bus for the band to travel. But the band doesn't need a whole bus. They just need enough seats for them and their instruments. So then we said, hey, you know what? Whoever wants to ride can ride. So we were taking our audience with us on those trips with us. So we would show up in St. Louis, and a bus of people from Atlanta would show up there. And we'd go to Baltimore, and a busload of people from Atlanta would show up there. And we did it for several markets. We would like pile in and we would like be freestyling and just talking and, you know, just hanging out on the way to these different cities. It was a time, man. It was a, it was a moment. Action. And we're back. Over here we have Jabari Graham downloading some stuff. Also in the morning time, we just finished having a cold ass breakfast. Hash browns like made of ice. <laughs> She's a frozen. <laughs> so. That season was amazing. On that show, we had Clyde Stubblefield, James Brown's drummer, the funky drummer was on tour, DJ Lord from Public Enemy, Mansions on the Moon, Scarface from the Ghetto Boys, and Digital Underground. 
you know, that's a serious lineup. And that was every city, you know, we did eight markets at that year. So to go from, you know, hitting it out the ballpark, we thought the next set of shows were gonna be like overseas someplace. And then um, things didn't plan out like that. When we first started out, we really didn't have supreme control of our show. If you don't have control over your ideas or how things are executed, you know, you're leaving it up to someone else. You know, a lot of the things that were being done, you know, not necessarily with us driving the ship. You have this program that you birth, but there's a ceiling of how far you can take it with this company that you're working for, who's also getting paid from this client that's funding everything. We got pimp. We can say, hey, we need X amount of money for the budget to put on the show. And as a middleman, you can say, all right, well, they need X amount. We're gonna put X more amount on, on that. And we may have ideas that we wanna do to the show, but those ideas may not go to the client. They might just stay with the middleman. You know, we wore some high heel shoes, you know? So you gotta walk a, 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 a tight line to, to uh, make that work for the client and their client, but also uh, do what's best for you. We didn't know how to do the tour. They didn't really know how to do it. We're all figuring it out. It wasn't like there was a blueprint for this. You know, it wasn't like somebody can call up and be like, hey man, how do you do a one night only art show that travels around the country? You know, the, the, we're gonna ask for that. But it was a good chance to see and learn, hey, this can go on a road. Working with the middleman, we didn't have a contract. It was like show to show, but it wasn't like a long term, hey, we want you for three years or this five show deal. It was just one offs in a way. We learned how to get screwed over. And I'm glad that I had that lesson. So what happened is the relationship between the agency and Jack Daniels dissolved. And then after that happened, we got dropped. Mentally, we were trying to figure out how to get it back going again. Because, you know, when you're placed in a situation where things aren't certain, you really got to spend some time, like, how do I handle this? And then how do we figure things out? And then it so happened that, you know, that was the biggest blessing ever. We had the opportunity to work directly with Jack Daniels. I quit the circus. I went to Cedric Walker, and I remember going to his office to say, hey, look, this is something I want to try to do. I want to take a risk in this. And I shook his hand, and then I was out the door. ABL became my job. I saw the relevance in this program from day one. I knew it made sense for the community. I knew it made sense for our company, and it was a great working relationship. When you have those things, you continue to invest in them, and they keep giving back in different ways. Evolving that relationship eliminated the previous agency that allowed us to work directly with Jabari and Dub. We got a chance to uh, take them high heel shoes off and wear some pimp shoes. <laughs> Once we started working directly with Jack Daniels, things changed drastically. We had new walls, new cases. You know, they helped problem solve a lot of the things that we were having issues with. And it helped us in our efficiency. And you know, how to run the stage better, how to set the walls up better, how to ship the art better, how to do all that felt better for us to be in that position now. Even though it's scary when you take the steering wheel for yourself for the first time. It's kind of, you're like, oh, am I gonna crash the ship? What's gonna happen? But once you're able to do that, and you realize, wait a minute, we got this. And that took us up a whole another level. So Joe's keeping ABL alive, but we still have to make it work in every market. We had no choice but to make sure that we knocked it out the park. And we had to make Joe look good. So we can keep doing the show. In every city we went into, we saw the crowd, the community respond to it. The first show was absolutely incredible. We wound up having lines around the corner. We had so much electronics running through the building at the time, it shut down the electrical system and we had to bring in the generator to get us through the night. We knew at that point with the energy, with the art, with the beverages, we knew we had a winning combination that would serve us well for an extended period of time. And it has. Joe kept it alive in his uh, southeastern region, Charlotte, Birmingham, Jackson, Mississippi, St. Louis, Atlanta. 
And then other regional managers wanted to keep ABO going in their markets as well. That led to more cities or the next year, or the more tour cycles. Some markets may not have experienced anything like our show. You know, you want to inspire people. You want people to be excited to come to the show and then go home and make their own art, make their own event or do whatever. So when we go to different markets, we find a similar audience that wants to see the stuff we do and experience the stuff we do. This is it, this is what I gotta do. It, it ain't no more circus. I can't go back over there, so I gotta make this work. I gotta knock it out every city. I gotta make sure it's dope. Good turnouts, blah, 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 everything's gotta be nice. I didn't have no choice. It rested on my shoulders, man. It's an event, it's a party, it's an amazing time. At the end of the day, it is still his job. It's still his profession. It's still his, his source of income. He goes into you know, what we affectionately call show jabari, where he is like hyper-focused on all the logistics that have to happen. Right here we have some merch ideas that we want to do for ABL, some equipment that we actually got built for some cases that we're going to put the art in. Um, this is a schedule that I have for the breakdown of everything at the warehouse before it leaves to go to Miami. And, you know, I'll write things on the wall uh, just to get out of my mind. It's all about just having a game plan. This is kind of like my brain <laughs> in here. Oh, he's completely dedicated. There is no question. This is his baby. This is the thing that he created from an idea. And his focus is singularly, you know, locked into to ABL. So, you know, he's traveling all of the time. You know, we meet up in these cities, but I, I try to give him the space that he needs for that. You know, it can be hard to know what that boundary is. And I have had to learn that over the years. And, you know, he don't play either. And that's with me, that's with his mama, that's with anybody. Show Jabari, you really don't try to have too much of a conversation. <laughs> you just let him be when he's in that business mode. He's very, very focused when it's showtime. I want to make sure that my time is spent well and I can produce. And I try not to have too much distractions. I just want to deliver. This is what I thought I designed. That's not what I designed, though. No, I it's, it's to... different. Yeah, because I thought I designed her as she was coming out, which is this half of it. But I accidentally had her whole head come out. That's fine. So that's what I was going to ask you. Should I go back to doing this? No, like don't cut, no, 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 no. So, all right, OK. So yeah, do yeah, I yeah. need to complete her shoulder over here, then? Yeah, well, you already have it. Yeah. You already have the shoulder, though. But the shoulder is stopping at oh, the shadow. Oh, so you want, so she's supposed to be coming out of a cutout. Yeah, on that So whole part of her head is behind the cutout, and the other yeah, is it's coming, coming out of So that gives you the depth yeah. perception that she's, yeah. gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So I'm going to have to paint over. No! It's going to have to happen. No! Brother, look. Why? What's wrong with that? Our speech and lyrics has been a safe space and growing for over a decade now which is a big reason why I participate. Really, and I respect Dub and love Dub so much, like, honestly, I, I barely tell him no. <laughs> like, if he invites me to do anything, more likely than not, unless I just don't have time, I'm gonna do it. Honestly, that's the biggest part of my practice, um, is actually mentorship and creating safe spaces um, for other artists and stuff. And when I say safe space, I'm not just saying like a room full of black people because just because you're in a room with people that look like you doesn't mean it's a safe space. I mean like a real true safe space and helping them get jobs, like creating uh, work opportunities for them. When I learn new stuff about contracts or rates or techniques, I get to just pass it along. It's a beautiful thing. Because the reality is we can't keep it to ourselves. We, we can't take it with us, so. What's the point of holding on and not sharing space? Oh, yes, do. I have made some progress, but not a whole lot. It's acrylic? Yes, yeah, acrylic. Yeah, so now I'm going to start laying in some of the colors, and I have my trays. <laughs> yeah, you clean your palette, man. That's what I forgot. Your palette? My palette. 
I would say, you know, although I lived in the inner city, my mom provided a, you know, a pretty nice upbringing for me and my sister. Uh, of course, we didn't have the, you know, the fanciest stuff, and uh, you know, it was a lot of great value groceries. But you know, that's the best my mom can do, and I appreciate her extremely for it. Man, I mean, it was just her raising me and my sister. Most of the time, when I was able to keep my nose clean, it was because I really took the football. I was like always in my own head. So when it came to sketching and drawing and stuff like that, you know, it was cool to show my friends, hey, look at this, you know, look at this sketch or drawing I did of Batman. And I'm like, oh man, that's so cool, Sean. Now, where's the chain? Do you have, do you actually have that chain? Do I actually, no, no, I just found a picture on the internet. Okay, you didn't actually buy that chain? <laughs> Tell get away from me. No, nah, man, you gotta invest in your props. The, that, that's a different type <laughs> of investment. <laughs> That's How a, serious do you take this business, yeah, that's man? Not, that's not you gotta, artist, that, you gotta go there. That's not artist money investment. <laughs> you gotta go there, man. Oh, did man. You, you didn't buy the robe, too? No, I did not. Okay. This is like, <laughs> like a collection of images I found. Some of this like is from, like, I also found this picture of this guy with this purple magic. He was a, he was a, a magician. magician. And he had this purple cape on. I was like, hey, yeah, I love that tone. So I now, stole that. at the show, mm -hmm. would, it, would it be too much for you to wear it? The cape? Is that asking too much? <laughs> I found the image. I did not find the actual thing. I am at the final touches before I leave to Miami in less than 24 hours. I work best uh, under pressure, so it's kind of worked out. And the only thing that has taken the longest and that I still haven't done yet is the art prints that will be in the frames. But. I've already come up with the concept and I feel like it has so much like spiritual meaning that I want to do it in Miami because for me that's like home. I'm from South Florida and I want to just like illustrate it being on the beach and in my peace. Once I get to Miami, it'll be like, all right, I'm here. Like, that's it, it's chill. It's like um, a process of letting go of the peace and being like, this is it, girl. Like, let it go, like, this is it. Like, you got it, you know? I am heading home tomorrow, um, tomorrow evening, and uh, if everything works out right, then I will meet this piece again down in Miami for the season's opener. If a check calls me, then I will be in Miami. But if it does not, I will meet it in another city. <laughs> But the way you blend this gold, I mean, it seemed like you just keep getting better and better. Like, I remember that slick rip. I think that was the first time I saw that it. That was the first gold. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, I had to, I had to get it right. I had to get it right for Juju, <laughs> for my knees. Yeah, this is good progression, though, man. I love to see it. Yeah, absolutely, man. They gonna love it, I'm telling you. <laughs> I had to give you some lip gloss, because your bottom <laughs> lip was crusty. <laughs> What I tell you about that? <laughs> My whole lip all crusty. I had to give you some, had to give you some lip gloss or anything. Well, thank you, Juju. Thank you so much for letting Uncle Stu use you as his muse for the Art Beats and Lyrics show. You love it? Yes. Give me a high five. There we go. Oh, oh, there we go. <laughs> Two, two extra hands. You okay. Know, which one we do? Uh, just loading stuff in there. That's all. I mean, which which ones? I'm trying to figure that which one. To... All right. Yeah. Right now we are breaking down everything so we can get it in the truck. We got art handlers. We figure out where everything goes. Then we break it down. We put the art in its cases. We load the walls onto their cases, and then we load that onto the truck for the show in Miami. And then it's on the road. So uh, we're getting ready for this show. And uh, yo, y'all get ready. I know I said get ready about five million times, but fuck it, get ready for this motherfucker and we're gonna have fun. Peace.
currently we are in Wynwood. This area is more focused, I wanna say, on murals, graffiti. This is more of the street art scene, so I love to come to this area specifically. The ABL experience is that you're getting Atlanta culture. Everybody else, again, around the world who's coming to travel, we're giving them a dose of ATL, how we show up, how we represent. And to be quite honest with you, Atlanta has Miami in a chokehold right now. I came into town Wednesday, Dub came in. I hey, yesterday. Yeah, Thursday. And right now we're doing our final walkthrough at Lone Depot Park. Oh, maybe right here. That might be kind of cool. Where's the entrance to Dub? It's kind of like to visualize things before we actually load in tomorrow. Um, if there's any uh-oh mistakes or just any call outs, because anything can happen day of event. Are we doing the same barricades for the stage? Because in the warehouse, you're only seeing like maybe 45% of the show. Then you got the other part with the light boxes, and then you'll have the, the venue and all that. Most of our staff is coming in today, so we want to try to link up with them. The event is tomorrow. You know, we're looking forward to it. You know? <laughs> yeah, the countdown is on. Yeah. So what we're going to do now, I'm going to put you with a team. My name is Cedric Lott. I'm one of the operations managers for the tour. I've been involved with ABL for about 11 years now. We got a real good team with us now to actually help us kind of put things together. Do you need any gloves or anything? OK, all right. I've been involved with Art Beats and Lyrics for seven years. Coming from Atlanta, you know, they have the saying, Atlanta influences everything. Most of the folks on this team are from Atlanta. We're like family, so when we go on the road, it feels like we're on a music tour. I love being on the road. I love meeting people in each city we go to, working with other artists. We started work this morning about 5.30. Uh, set up, touch up the walls, hang all the artwork. Uh, we'll put labels up shortly. But yes, yeah, a full day's of work. You know, Jabari's crunch time is getting the doors open. You know, that's when it gets real tense. He makes sure that opens up. Yeah. My crunch time is getting the walls and all the art ready. So once we get past those big hurdles, then we can chill slightly. Yeah. <laughs> and, slightly. Yeah. And then the, the event just kind of takes a life of its own. Event production is not easy, OK? It's, it's not even fun. It's tedious. Uh, it's fun if it's in your blood. It's. Uh, nerve-wracking, you got to deal with logistics and staffing and fundraising and development and all of that. We kind of turn the soil for our creative artists here. It's been fantastic, man. Uh, Miami's always a great time. All the faces that you see that come to these events, enjoy the music, enjoy the art, everything is great. It makes all the, the, the work you put in and the sacrifices you make, makes it all worth it. I'm excited, man. I got like a, like a little anxious thing going on. I always get right before a show, but I'm just really excited to, I don't know, kind of fully immerse myself in the culture and I guess take in people taking in the artwork. You know what I'm saying? And I can't wait to see Raekwon tonight. It's going to be crazy. Showtime, man. I'll be so fresh. I'll be, I'll be so fresh. I'll be, I'll be so fresh. I'll be, I'll be so fresh. I'll be fresh, fly, eat it, eat it. Fresh, fly, eat it, eat it. All of the above, all of, all of the above. I feel amazing, elated, fantastic, joyful, blessed. It means the 20th anniversary. This is going to be a magical night. Just another stamp in history of what Jabari and Dove have been creating. It's a legacy, right? And we're here to celebrate that. It's fun when the crowd starts coming in and then I can look at people's reaction based on the artwork we've been working on. This is going to be our first time showing it. I feel a little nervous, but I feel good because it's already a big crowd. 
If your work sells, that's great. If it doesn't, it's fine. I make my art because I make my art. Yeah, it's gonna be good. It's gonna be good. Cool, but I boutiques cause the real sh that you can't get slapped. I would never have on the same. I check my Gucci Chuck Taylor. Can't copy it. Hey, stop it. Music and art to me are synonymous, you know what I'm saying? They both invoke feelings and they both take feelings to create. I hope somebody sees the piece and if they don't want to buy it, it still gives them a feeling of confidence, gives them a feeling of recognition that they're seen and that they're heard. Some people came for the artwork. Some people came here for the alcohol, but everybody came for the music. It's the one thing that can bring us all together. That's the power of music. It's the one key to world peace. Thank you to all of our vendors, all of our sponsors. Make some noise to all the artists that have created these wonderful pieces for y'all to look at. 20 seasons of doing this job, it always gets better every time, man. And, and we appreciate y'all. And it's because of y'all that we're still able to do this. Y'all didn't have to be here, but y'all chose to be here. We've been chasing our dreams for two decades. And because of y'all, we're still able to chase our dreams. We used to be in dive bars. <laughs> so to go from a dive bar to a ballpark, 20 years later, that's one of those mama I made it moments. I was actually um, hanging out with a couple of my old college buddies that live here in Miami. They come out every year when I come down and, uh, you know, show love. So we were taking some pictures, kind of just having a good time in front of my piece in the mural. And uh, I see W, he was like, hey man, as soon as we get back to the city, we got to make a print because the piece sold. And I was like, the piece did what? It's weird when you, when you take a risk on something and you've been doing it for 20 years now and that's longer than some festivals even happen or some corporations. So one thing that I'll say, yes, I'm proud of doing ABL for 20 years, but also I'm proud of taking a risk on myself. And if there's anyone out there who has an idea or some kind of concept don't be afraid to take a risk on yourself because you may can have a career on it. For some odd reason, like W and Jabari, find a way or make a way to make it happen. At a certain point, we're all gonna expire, but we all gotta have something to leave behind. This is a testimony that we were here 
This is our testimony. So we got to make it right. Are you friends with anybody? Dangerous. We dangerous. Spot him. I heard they looking for them racks, but my young already got them.